this is a coming an ongoing series for me to come give a talk at least once a semester at the mine. So today I wanted to talk about something I hadn't discussed yet. So we're hopefully only talk just a little bit about frontal data. Um, today I'm going to talk about one field of the computational modeling I do, and this is largely discussed in terms of decision making. And as you can imagine, it's a rather uh, constrained model of decision making. But oftentimes, if you look in the imaging literature about what a model of decision making looks like, it'll look something like this. This is a representation of the drift diffusion model. I'm going to talk to you today about the virtues and the use of this model in psychology, psychiatry, neurology studies, especially in determining the specific neural systems that underlie distinct parameters of this model. So I'll walk you through the little parts of this. But first, I'll describe why you might want to use this model. In any sort of two alternative force choice task, which most of you could verify that it's kind of our favorite type of task to do as psychologists, you uh, have people making decisions between two alternatives, and they have speed and accuracy. You might have a memory recall study or a decision making study between two symbols that were previously associated with different types of rewards or punishments. It's actually what I'm going to talk about mainly today. Or well, really familiar use of this study is the uh, random dots, where at some point a lot of dots are moving around and some of them start moving in a coherent direction. And this can be used to derive evidence uh, accumulation. But also you can see it in general performance monitoring indices, like the uh, Flanders task or an anti saccade task, where you need to look away from that dot. Or something like an AX, AY uh, continuous performance task. All these two alternative force choice tasks give you great behavioral data. They give you a lot about how people learn, how they can be accurate, and how fast they are. But the argument behind computational modeling is that the objective, the manifest indicators of behavior, while useful, don't actually tell you what the latent neural processes underlying them. You don't have a response time region in your brain. You don't have an accuracy box somewhere. You probably have more complex processes going on behind the curtain of awareness that are only revealed through these manifest features. So this type of modeling looks to reveal those latent parameters. And as I'm going to give you evidence today, these latent parameters can explain brain activity better, probably closer to the actual computations expressed in the brain, and they potentially can be used to diagnose uh, different uh, patient groups with better accuracy than simple performance measures. So in the drift diffusion model, uh, popularized by Roger Ratcliffe, and this is a very good introduction to the, the DDM model. Any single decision process is modeled as an ongoing accumulation of evidence. So all of these squiggly lines are, uh, represent a, something called a drift rate, or evidence accumulation. If you know the face you saw was something presented to you the day before, if you can say that's an old face, you have a lot of evidence and uh, a sharp drift rate leading to a faster and more accurate response. So the manifest data is up here. This is, uh, drift diffusion modeling takes advantage of response time histograms for two alternatives, usually shown correct at the top and error at the bottom. So it accounts for the full, uh, we know there's a non-normal sort of this um, uh, x gaussian shape to response time distributions that can be accounted for by manifest variables like drift rate or how much evidence there is. For example, in the moving dots paradigm, if you have 90% of the dots moving to the left, you have a lot of evidence for which way the dots are going. If you have 51% of the dots moving to the left and 49 to the right, you have very little evidence. Your brain has to take longer, accumulate, 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 and eventually make a response. This drift rate parameter is rather well known, and the neural representations of it are rather well known as well. Today I'm going to talk about a lesser known phenomenon, the orthogonal contrast here, this decision threshold. At some point, a decision has to be made. A drift rate has to reach the threshold, and the response has to be executed. And this can vary. This threshold change, as I'll show you in a moment, can account for things like um, response caution. So as evidence accumulation changes, and these are simulations run to show you how this sort of holds up. As evidence accumulation uh, is simple, a high drift rate, you get fast correct, shown here in a, a fast latency of a response time histogram with very few errors. As evidence becomes more equivocal, like what do you want to have, A and W root beer or Pepsi? It's a difficult choice. You're going to take a little while, and you're going to pick one or the other with equal probabilities. The orthogonal axis you can see here are these response thresholds increasing or decreasing. 
to have fast responses, but a lot of errors, including fast errors, or slow responses with an extended tail of the response time histogram and very few errors. So based on the pattern of the orthogonalized accuracy and response time, you can derive how different types of contributing factors of drift rate and decision threshold have contributed to that. So here's an example from the Shadlin Newsom Gold Glimpsure type work where that monkey area LIP, some of you may be familiar with that, has been suggested to reflect a drift rate, evidence accumulation rates. The more evidence, the steeper the rate. At this bar here is the time of the response. You can see the steepness of the slope of evidence accumulation corresponds to the speed of the response time. So this uh, process in parietal cortex, in integrating evidence, which comes in as a step type function in your uh, medial temporal lobe for moving dots, has been suggested to represent a neural system for evidence accumulation. Exactly how these drift diffusion models, which are quite old, they're about, you know, they're older than 35 years or so of ev uh, evidence of decision making go, that this could very well be the uh, neural representation of the latent parameter of drift rate. There are fewer studies identifying a latent parameter of decision threshold increase. And that's what we're going to talk about today, based on some new models. So today I'm going to talk to you about this model of decision threshold, specifically facilitated by the subthalamic nucleus. And like most complex behaviors, there's probably a lot of ways you can adjust behaviors, including a lot of ways you can adjust your decision threshold. The STN is proposed to have a role in adjusting decision threshold, mainly upwards, specifically by slamming the brakes on behavior. And this uh, process was predicted by computational modeling of the basal ganglia before a lot of empirical data came out. I'll describe some tests of this theory, including hierarchical Bayesian estimation of DDM parameters, Thomas Leakey's HDDM toolbox, manipulation of STN states uh, with deep brain stimulation, direct recording of the human STN, and brand new data from an EEG fMRI combined experiment. And then I'm going to describe some uh, related experiments that were a bit more sort of on the fun and interesting side, looking at these associated parameters of eye tracking pupilometry, and then discuss what we're doing right now, both in the lab down south as well as with Parkinson's patients in surgery as well. And then I'll talk about the advantages of using this modeling approach for patient diagnosis. So to start, let's go back to the bigger picture, how the brain adapts to behavior. Why might you want to initiate a decision threshold increase, a speed accuracy trade-off of slowing down to become more accurate. Well, there's a lot of things in your life that come up that are difficult or conflicting or error-prone or you want to be cautious about. And we know brain systems, largely including the mid-singular cortex and basal ganglia, underlie this ability to adaptively adjust your behavior on a rapid type of basis. The Mid-singular cortex and a lot of premotor areas are directly connected to the subthalamic nucleus through something called the hyperdirect pathway. And the discovery of this was, was really important because we had a couple of decades of knowing about the directional, direct and indirect pathways from all of cortex through basal ganglia by which information is percolated and responses are either facilitated or inhibited by which you can uh, decide to choose AW root beer over Pepsi because you can weigh the positives and negatives of each choice. The discovery of a third directional pathway is rather novel. It's called hyperdirect because it's fast. It's um, single uh, synapse latency between these premotor areas and the subthalamic nucleus, which is a very tiny tic tac shaped uh, sized brain system uh, deep underneath the globe's pelvis. The STN is basically a brake. It's a, just the same as the brake in your car. It slams the brake on the basal ganglia and does not allow it to output a decision. We know that there's uh, connections between these regions. Uh, this is an example from humans from the diffusion tractography by Adam Aron, who's linked this to a stop signal reaction high performance task. There's a lot of monkey neurophysiology describing this detail of the hyperdirect pathway, and not just from mid singular to pre SMA, but also from, um, in this case, <coughs> right to your frontal cortex, from Adam's work that to underlie uh, the stopping ability. Through some computational modeling done by Michael Frank, who uh, all the, almost all the work you're going to see today I did with Michael Frank, his uh, neural network model of the basal ganglia has proposed a specific role for the subthalamic nucleus. By modeling how the system works, novel predictions can be made about brain function. And what the STN does is help you hold your horses, helps you apply you a brake. And what's really critical to know about the dynamics of this, and something that uh, 
this neural network modeling here shown in the emergent uh, platform, what it allows is a deep understanding of exactly what's happening while that break is on. By changing when responses are executed, you can change what is executed. So it's an important decision-making facilitatory process by slamming on the brakes and allowing the striatum, the direct and indirect pathways, to continue to duke out positive and negative information so better responses can be made. Holding your horses helps you make informed decisions. The model holds up well compared to data from, uh, this is Isada, Isada uh, data from monkeys in an anti saccade test. These are the response time histograms from the model and the data. Uh, very difficult to tell the difference between the two. It's a very uh, well utilized model. And other novel predictions have been made from this model as well. For example, we know in the case of dopamine depletion, uh, the STN engages in aberrant oscillatory patterns by uh, aberrant connectivity with global halibus. It causes this about four hertz oscillation, which is the exact tremor that the resting Parkinsonian tremors have for that. This is thought to be the basic neural substrate, the cause of motor tremor. This actually happens in the same emergent computational model. If you uh, limit dopamine supply to the subgonal nucleus, it oscillates at the same four hertz range. So uh, this is some convergent evidence. The model was not built to do this, yet it does this. So it seems to capture STN dynamics pretty well. In Parkinson's patients, this tremor is effectively treated by deep brain stimulation, putting two electrodes in, here you see your Medtronic 380 electrodes, deep into the brain and just zapping the STN, or the globus pallidus. And we don't really know exactly what's happening down there, but it, it's at least termed a functional lesion, and it's probably disallowing the system to function. And it's really profound. In some of the studies, I did run these with patients who were on and off uh, stimulation. And as soon as you turn them off from the battery in their chest, the tremor comes back nearly immediately. And when you turn them back on, it goes away not as rapid, but pretty rapidly. So it's, it's extremely tightly tied, this motoric output, to the actual uh, SDN GPE abnormal synchrony. But what happens to this brain system that we've functionally lesioned? What happens to this brain system we've knocked out? You can't hold your horses anymore. By not being allowed to uh, slow down your decisions, you're more likely to make bad decisions. You're more likely to be fast and impulsive. And a lot of the work I'm going to describe to you is from some variant of this probabilistic selection task, which we've used ad nauseum in our lab and other labs around the world. It's the, uh, the task was the uh, neural model was built to handle. And in this task, you'll see different pairs of stimuli, which are previously benign. Here, they're just hieragonic characters. And by selecting one, they learn that, for example, this character is associated with reward more often than this one. And they'll learn this one's better than that one, that one's better than that one, that one's better than that one. We call these A better than B, C, D, E, F. Through the course of training, they learn that some are better, some are worse. Some have acquired positive value, some negative value. We put people in a post-learning test phase to see which one they prefer. And in this case, we're going to look at what I'm calling conflict, this value conflict. If you put A and C together, A was rewarded 80% of the time you select it. It's a good choice. C was rewarded 70% of the time you select it. It's also a pretty good choice. So when we ask you, which one of these do you like better? That's a tough decision. They're both pretty close in value. There's an optimal answer, but it's difficult. We call this win-win conflict. Conversely, you can put two bad ones together, like B, which only rewarded you 20% of the time you selected it. You learn to avoid B and D, which only rewarded you 30% of the time you selected. You learned both of these are bad. So when you put these together and say which one's better, <coughs> kind of out of luck, either one of them's better. We call this lose-lose conflict. So here we're initiating conflict on previously benign stimuli. And it's pure decision valuation conflict, not a conflict like you see in a Simon task, although I think it's quite analogous in some ways. And the contrast to this is low conflict, a win-lose. Put the A with the B. You know one of them's great, you know one of them's bad, it's an easy, fast choice to make. So we're gonna look at this decision making and these integrated values that the striatum, the direct and indirect pathway, have integrated evidence for some stimuli being good and some being bad. And it's gonna duke up the decision making procedure. Michael Frank had shown in 2007 that really, it's really just when patients are on deep brain stimulation that they are faster in these high conflict choices and less accurate. It's not when they're off, 
It's not in Parkinson's patients on medication, not in Parkinson's patients on medication, not in normal seniors. You see, when you have to make a difficult decision, when values are close together, you have a little bit of a longer reaction time. And that is abolished and actually reversed when your deep brain stimulator is on, when your STM is knocked out. So we replicated this finding. This is a paper from 2011. And here we're looking at two different types of conflict, the win-win, the lose-lose. And all results are mirrored between these two types as well. In this study, we looked at RT change uh, for these high conflict over the low conflict situations. And you see, really, when they're making the worst choice, the suboptimal choice, they were faster in both of these. So they were faster when they were wrong. So they had a conjunctive problem in making fast, bad decisions. We wanted to tie this to some of these candidate networks. We know the STN was being zapped out and the hyperdrive system was not being allowed to function. But what about the systems that were feeding the information to the hyperdrive system in the first place? And here, of course, it's, I think the, one of the few mentions of frontal theta I'll make today, we looked at frontal theta as our measurement of this mid-singulate alarm bell. So if you've come to any of my talks for free pizza or subs, you've probably heard about this system. We know that frontal theta as reflecting this sort of neural alarm bell that something's gone wrong, that you have conflict or error or punishment, something's gone wrong, you need to adjust, it tends to predict slower response times, especially in high conflict situations. And here what you're seeing is a regression coefficient. As theta increases, people slow down more. That's true in the control group, true in the patients when their stimulators were off, but actually this reversed when their stimulators were on, which is pretty bad. So again, the more alarm bell they got there, that they were facing a bad decision, they actually had the exact opposite behavioral effect that you want. They weren't able to slow down. They sped up. And these reflect these uh, uh, phenomena were somewhat reflected or flipped in the low conflict situation. So here we were able to tie activities in the lower subthalamic nucleus being knocked out to activities in the cingulate feeding that information in. But again, what we're watching here is a conjunction between response time uh, condition-wide performance and accuracy. We're not looking at uh, something that appears to be a manifest problem. There's some complex system underlying this speeding up to bad choices. This tells us it's probably a decision threshold problem. And again, from the computational modeling, we think that the decision threshold increase so STN allows you to slam on the brakes, to take longer to make a response, but to be more accurate. To decide when, uh, when to respond to help you decide what to respond for. So we've done some preliminary modeling and saw that these data did look like they reflect the decision threshold. Um, but we teamed up with Thomas Vick, who was Michael's postdoc, who was developing this hierarchical drift diffusion modeling toolbox. This is a free Python toolbox available. It's quite user friendly. It comes with its own web page. And this uses a hierarchical Bayesian parameter estimation. So you can take your patient groups, and it runs Markov Chain Monte Carlo to sort of bootstrap the, the distributions of probability for the data. And you can estimate the subject level variance along with the group level variance. It's really a smart way to look at uh, subject within groups and differences between groups. Within this framework, Thomas had allowed something, I think, very sophisticated, which was single trial regression. You use a single uh, a, at a single trial level, use some sort of indicator. For example, here, control signals, we think relate to decision threshold increase. So this computational advancement facilitated, opened the doors for a whole new type of neuroscience research by looking at trial by trial influence of a third variable, say a neural variable or a psychophysiological variable, any sort of trial by trial variable on DDM uh, threshold parameters. So what you get out of that is a Bayesian belief distribution, a posterior density distribution that provides not only an estimate of the mean, of the average of some regression coefficient, but of its variance as well. So here you're looking at a belief distribution that a single trial theta increases, this is in threshold increases. This toolbox has allowed us to take the uh, observable neural indices and probe their influence on the latent uh, <coughs> computational, cognitive, uh, dynamics underlying this decision. So on high conflict choices, in Parkinson patients with their deep brain stimulation off, just a normal Parkinsonian patient, the more frontal theta they had, the more they increased their threshold. And you can see here 97.5% at least of this uh, distribution is to the east of zero, so it's a significant effect. 
And this was only to the high conflict choices. Only people have to uh, face down a difficult decision. Is theta really involved in adjusting this network? Critically, when you zap the ST and you turn the stimulator on, this effect is abolished and even somewhat reversed. So similar to the effects we were seeing in RT, we're now accounting for the global performance parameters with one computational parameter, as well as neural data that can predict variance in that at a single trial level. That allows us a strong test, a manipulation of a brain system, but that doesn't allow us to actually know what the STN is doing. That's pretty deep down there. But one of the lucky things about sticking electrodes down there is before you stimulate, you can record from the same electrode. And the neurosurgeons always do this to make sure they're, you know, they're in the right region, and when the, the, uh, they do stimulate, it's not uh, interfering with any other function like uh, hands or mouth movements or something. So there's a lot of work in surgery of placing this, recording from it, stimulating, and just really double checking this is in the right place. You can take advantage of this to pre present a task to patients during surgery. So this is eight patients I gathered surgical data on in Tucson, Arizona, on the exact same task the Parkinson's patients who were on off stimulation took in our laboratory. What you see here is a lead from the SDN. You're seeing the high-low conflict difference within the subclinic nucleus, and this is permutation testing demonstrate that there is an increase in low frequency activities at the lower edge of the theta band. So upper depth, low to theta, about two and a half to five hertz, we're seeing increased activity in the STN. What's been interesting since then, since 2011, a number of groups have come out showing about that same frequency range being responsive to conflict and errors. So we think we've identified a specific, I guess, language by which cortex and STN seem to be communicating. This is our, our model summarizing this task. In black, you have your general responses, and in red, your enhanced decision conflict. Those win, win, or lose, lose choices. As the medial frontal cortex detects conflict, recorded through EEG, it sends a hyperdirect signal down to the SDN, and the SDN slams on the brakes to the stride up, increasing the threshold, varying the response time. If you knock out the SDN, you can still get the alarm bells, which we still did see were intact in the patient with the DBS. But you basically like severed the telephone wires. There's there's no trial gating going on, and you abolish this hyperdirectability to control behavior. We did look again at eight more patients in this same setup, looking at another phenomenon related to decision threshold increase, and this is the speed accuracy trade-off commonly observed after errors, called post-error slowing. You make a wrong button press in one of these flankers or uh, simple anti-saccade tasks. Your next trial is slower and more accurate. The general performance phenomenon has been detailed for 40, 50 years. This meta-analysis shows that frontal theta predicts the degree of post error slowing. As we might expect, the degree of uh, error signal you get, the degree of importance of it predicts how much you slow down. But we don't know how that is instantiated, actually. And this is an old effect. It's from the 60s. We know about post error slowing for a long time. But what causes the slowing? To do this, we looked at a simple Simon task and looked at error and post-error trials. And instead of looking at the error trial, here I looked at the trial on which they actually slowed down and matched correct trials to that. So if you're looking at a trial after you made a stake and you are slower, is the SDN specifically involved in this strategic adjustment of decision threshold? And we saw some increased activity in actually SDN uh, phase dynamics in the theta band. So anyone in my course right now can know, you can look at single trial regression of um, phase activities only on the error trials in about the same two and a half to five hertz band shown in the previous data, as well as with this previous literature. So we are, as a field, uh, just rapidly becoming to understand the way that this hyperdirect pathway functions. And just about a month ago, this group, Zavala and Peter Brown's group, published one demonstrating that uh, medial frontal cortex is Granger predictive of low frequency activities around four hertz in STN. So uh, the field is rapidly advancing on describing the nature of this hyperdirect communication using low frequencies. Can you, I'm sorry, I didn't take your class. <laughs> sorry, I didn't want to get into the gory details. Well, just, just like two sentences. Looking so at single trial regression of something like reaction time on power is very easy, but phase is circularly distributed, so it's harder, because how do you correlate with a circle? Using circular statistics common to cross-frequency coupling, you can look at the modulation of the phase angle by RT, and if you have... Uh, so the speed up, slowing down? Uh, exactly, okay. exactly. So you can see if um, longer RTs are paired with specific types of phase consistency, suggesting that 
as you slow down more, you have greater phase consistency. As you speed up less, you have more random phase. So just again, the, the phase is undermining the effect specifically. Okay. And that's why uh, you see this in modulation index, not in power. Okay. We very recently, this is right in the summer, the last weeks before I left Brown, looked at this question using combined EEG fMRI. And this paper was just accepted to J Neuroscience yesterday. So you might see it pop up in your feed. And this was through a big group of fMRI people, some EEG people, Thomas and Michael as well. And it's a, a very simple type of the um, learning decision making task that I've described to you previously. So this group wanted to look at uh, pre-SMA and SDN as Cs. And so they got masks, and there are masks for SDN. I'm not an imager, so uh, I'll, I'll let them debate the uh, accuracy and validity of these uh, brainstem masks. But the data we got were rather, um, rather interesting and rather supportive of this. In line with a role for something like slamming on a brake, the STN mask predicted decision threshold increase, just globally. So the more bold activity you had in this STN mask, the greater decision threshold you had. And in line with the EEG data we saw before, where only in high conflict trials does medial frontal cortex in, uh, relate to decision threshold, we saw that with pre-SMA as well. So pre-SMA by conflict, the interaction predicted decision threshold increases. Combining EEG and fMRI was uh, challenging. Uh, functionally combining them, not just getting the raw data, which was quite easy compared to actually having them make sense of each other, which was very difficult. But we did use uh, some Laplacian transform of the EEG, which is gonna naturally knock out a lot of deep sources. And we did get a significant correlation in a whole brain estimate of the, sub, uh, the SMA, the supplemental motor area, with this frontal data response to the cues as people are making decisions. And what's really interesting is in another whole brain regression of uh, a psychophysiological interaction index, the conflict by theta correlate, uh, the, the interaction picked up brainstem activity overlapping with the SDN mask. Again, suggesting when theta is high to conflict, Brain, the area in the brain in the bold signals responsive to that is in the SDN. And the critical test came in this third three-way interaction as theta is high and SDN bold is present. And in the case of conflict, you get an increase in decision threshold. So by applying a lot of different techniques together at the same time, we're coming on to, I think, a uh, cohesive investigation of how these brain dynamics of this hyperdirect pathway contribute to adaptive slowing. I did want to discuss, I think, a tangentially related study, one I'm, I'm kind of fond of, one I wanted to do just because I thought it'd be kind of fun. And this was using eye tracking and pupillometry in this same study. And the reason I wanted to do this was many fold. But I'll give you the example from the, of course, erased first two paragraphs of the initial draft, which the reviewers needed. I wanted something that seemed relevant to real life, not this vague promise of a future understanding of disease and diagnosis, which of course I'm very interested in, too. but something that might be utilized in the world, might be utilized in a health-related or commercial-related uh, development, because the hypothesis behind this is that by observing an individual, not even putting a sensor on them, by simply having a camera at their eyes, you can potentially dissociate two different latent decision processes. Eye gaze is a tremendous predictor of what people are going to do what they're going to select. That's very well known. Before people know what they're going to pick, you can predict it from their eye gaze, suggesting it has something to do with the evidence accumulation. Uh, and there were some papers suggesting that very directly. But no one ever looked at pupillometry specifically as an index of decision threshold increase. We know the pupil, pupil response is a slow, like, sympathetic, autonomic, um, sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic reactivity, but it's tightly tied to anterior cortex function especially in terms of errors. So the study was pretty interesting. I, I rather enjoyed doing this one. And we had demonstrated that as somebody looks more at one stimuli, they're more likely to select it. And in the case of really easy choices, the win-lose choices, they're much faster at selecting it. And that, that conjunction almost directly leads to an increase in drift rate. And these are, again, the uh, phasing on posterior density distributions, which are way, way beyond, uh, you know, way east of the zero line. These are strongly significant. For all cases, the longer you look at something, 
the more we can see the single trial influence of that gaze rate on increasing your drift rate. What was not known, though, were these pupil responses you get. And we know trial by trial pupil variation is related to things that are important, when something goes wrong or is interesting or is difficult or demanding. The same phenomena that activate medial prefrontal cortex. Here you see the pupil response shown as a percent change from baseline. And it, is, it was larger for high conflict cases over low conflict cases. And using that low conflict case as a contrast to account for a lot of uh, canonical pupil dynamics, you did see that in both cases, win-win and lose-lose decision making, pupil dilation predicted decision threshold increase, likely due to its role as an indicator of medial frontal functions. So we hear, we've seen again for medial frontal bold, EG, and downstream indicators, it seems to be the alarm bell behind the signal of the need for decision threshold adjustment. For an interim summary, that was the, uh, the first part describing the medial frontal, prefrontal cortex with the eye as a downstream indicator of this. And we have evidence from STM manipulation, STM bold, and STM local field potentials that it's involved in the specific role of being a break in this threshold increase. But let's see what's next. What are we doing next about this question? <clears throat> so while I was still at Brown, I developed a task to simultaneously parse decision threshold increases and drift, uh, drift rate increases, which has a variety of uses. So in this, we use a random dots paradigm, where these dots, the 100 dots in total, they're moving in random directions, and at some point, some percentage of them start moving to the left or the right, and the participants just press left or right. <clears throat> and they'll either move to these sort of two and 10 o'clock positions, which are reasonably easy. They're kind of very left, right. When those dots start moving, it's kind of obvious. So you can vary here the number of dots as a change in drift rate the coherence of the dots. If there's a lot of coherent dots, you have a lot of evidence. Very few dots, little evidence. But if the dots move to this close, and this is at about like 11.55 and 12.05 on a clock, they're very close together, it's very difficult to discern which side they're actually moving to. And what happens is you actually get a, both motor responses primed, which creates conflict. You have two motor responses primed, you can only make one. So we can have the dots moving close or far to change threshold and have different numbers of dots being easy or hard to change drift rate. So the piloting of this uh, was uh, successful. We'd run it in undergrads and uh, healthy seniors. But the reason this was developed was for a collaboration with uh, Wael Assad of Brown. I'll get to that in the next slide. We are <coughs> running this task right now in the PCNC down on uh, main campus where we can integrate eye tracking and EEG together. And so here I want to investigate, uh, extend those previous studies I'd shown before by seeing how much of the variance is similar in the drift rate adjustment between a pupil response and a frontal theta response, and how much of the decision threshold or the, the drift rate response in a parietal cortex is similar between the eye gaze and the accumulation of evidence. And this is from an N of one. <laughs> this is uh, being run right now by Dan Barto came in to get some pizza. And uh, this end of one, you can already see some differences. So between blue and red, you have easy and hard coherence. And you see here, the easy coherence drops off faster, you have a faster reaction times. But the hard, the red, the hard coherence stays with higher amplitude for a little bit longer. And that, that's quite a long time. That's, you know, it's about 700 milliseconds. You're seeing just right there in this one participant, which to an EEG response is a lifetime. You also see high versus low conflict in the cyan versus magenta. And in, low, in high conflict, you can see magenta being increased in sort of the P2 and early P3 ranges, where we might expect it. And this is a parietal seed. If I had selected the medial frontal seed, you'd probably see an enhanced high versus low conflict. So this study, I'm really excited to get off the ground and gather a lot of data on because we've uh, developed, through a lot of code Dan's written, the ability to integrate simultaneous eye tracking and EEG and ultimately plug that into the drift diffusion model. But what this task was originally designed for was patients in surgery. This is data from Wild Saad at Brown, who we had uh, collaborated with, and I just got these data. This is six patients. Most of them are STM patients, some of them are GPE patients. And it's shocking that under surgery, five out of six of these patients could perform this task well. And this is uh, all thrown into the HDDM framework and demonstrating that they did learn the task well. And despite any changes in dot movement in 
and evidence accumulation, really when the threshold increases, I meaning they have the near response compared to the far response, they had a much higher threshold. So our threshold manipulation works quite well, even in the case of part, uh, patients in surgery, which is a, a difficult situation. You're dealing with Parkinson's patients off their meds, on local meds, with holes in their brain, in a very difficult to sit in setup. They're cold, exhausted, tired, and scared. And they can still perform quite well on these tasks. The drift rate also worked quite well in the, the case of the uh, easy stimulus when they were uh, very simple. Here I label them congruent and complex just to help sort of the, the flavor of understanding. This is far apart, easy choices. The drift rate uh, is very discernible. It's somewhat hard to discern when all the dots are going in the same direction. There the the DDM in these six patients with limited data is hard, has a hard time on, uh, orthogonalizing those components of performance. But I'm not worried about that, mainly because we got three out of four predicted uh, dissociations in the modeling in these patients already. But again, what we're ultimately going to look for is trial by trial variation amongst these. So it doesn't really even matter how much any single variable changes, the variance within that variable in a person. And as I mentioned, I had got these data very recently. This is an example of uh, STN spikes, and that this data was not linked up to the behavioral data yet. I actually got a file earlier this week where the data are linked together. It's on my desktop. It's waiting for me to spend time on it. I unfortunately couldn't get that prepared for you guys this morning, but I did prepare this, which is showing that at the time of the queue, in 500 millisecond bins, you've increased STN spikes peaking right before the response, which is really where we'd expect STN spikes to peak if they're slamming the brakes in your behavior. Right before the response, we're gonna see the biggest bin of activity. So what we're gonna do is go back and look at both single trial spikes and uh, single trial DDM estimates to see how the STN is influencing the decision threshold. And the reason this is, this is exciting, we've already seen some data from, uh, well, we've never integrated STN recordings in the HDDM model outside of that bold experiment. That'll be interesting. But if you talk to neurophysiologists, they really think that the gold standard for something existing in the brain is to find a neuron that does it. I'm a local fields guy, I argue no. I show me a field response and I'm perfectly happy to see that that's what the brain computes. But at a, some, some people, their argument of you know, demonstrating that the brain performs a particular function, you have to find a single neuron that does that. And I'm pretty confident that this function of simply slamming on the brakes in specific cases of threshold and not specific cases where you're slowing down due to drift rate, or at least having those two being statistically differentiable, will be resolved at the level of the STN spike. And of course, we do have local fields with this, so we're going to look at that low frequency coupling as well and be able to link all the way up from single cells to fields to uh, manifest and latent performance as well. So this is going to be a very exciting study. Yeah. Looking at the bottom top, it's remarkable how much uh, change there is in the average across the whole trial. Is that normal for the STN? I think it's normal for spikes. Um, for, are you looking at, uh, say, um, this line here? Yeah, so that one's over 2,000, and a few, just three lines above it, it's below 500, the mean across the whole trial. Yeah, yeah, so these are, these are different spikes, and some of them are spiking just like wild wildfire, and specs are difficult to work with. I've worked with them a little bit before, and they are massively non-linear. Just even transforms don't even get you close to being able to manage it. So here I have uh, median specs over time, which is one way of managing it, but uh, I should have gone to SFM so I could pick the brains of a bunch of spike people with how you statistically manage this. But these are event trials for the same neur neurons, right? Uh, across the trial, yes, it's the same neuron. Yeah. And this is aggregated across six people. Oh. Yeah, so okay. it's just everyone stacked up on top of each other, all trials, all people, okay. just to look at the dynamics of how the spikes work. So you can I thought these were just sequential trials. Oh, so no, no, no. Okay. Everything's jammed together here just to see the, the statistical okay. dynamics. That's better. Thanks. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a little painful, but uh, okay. I think it'll be interesting. So let's see what's even nexter. So I just showed you what's next, but what could you apply this knowledge towards? So you've learned a lot about specific neural systems underlying a uh, hyper-specific way that people adapt their behavior. This is a paper uh, recently accepted by Thomas Vicky and Jeff Poland and Michael Frank in um, some sort of clinical journal, clinical psychological interest. 
I uh, forget the name unfortunately, and it's an argument for the field of computational psychiatry. And here they're making the general argument. It's a very interesting article, and it's available online on their website if you'd like to check it out. And they provide some specific examples I'll show to you. The argument behind computational psychiatry is that you know we've done we've gotten this far in defining diseases based on phenotypes, based on symptomatology, and that's we've done better than nothing. But um, arguably, as they argue in this paper, the field is at a bit of a crisis when you have major institutions creating a, an entirely new Bible based on symptomatology classification, but major funding agencies saying, well, we're going to hold off on funding symptom-based research, arguably you have a fielding crisis. And that's an argument they're trying to make in this paper. One solution to this could be to use um, biomarkers, endophenotypes, non-invasive types of tests. This is something we all know because we all write grants saying that we're going to do this. And I think we might in the future. The role of performance modeling in this, I think, is critical and worth considering as a central facet. What they're demonstrating here is if you have a cognitive test battery on some sort of patients, model them, estimate the parameters, and then use pattern classification to cluster these groups, you have the most arguably purely non-biased differentiation of this. If you can find groups that associate in this manner, then we have a successful approach to this field. Uh, a number of uh, Research groups are doing this for um, depression, uh, bipolar disorder, um, specific anxiety disorders. We'll see here, uh, this is an example, sort of a toy example, on some existing data of Roger Radcliffe's they model, just validating young versus old, which is two groups that are cognitively healthy. And I think this is a good toy model to work with, because we know there's subtle differences. They're not terribly overt, and these are two undeniable diagnostic categories. They're they're, they're quite young was you know college students and old were I think above 70. And this is on a battery of three different tasks, a memory task, a decision making task, a performance task. How well can you classify and dissociate these groups? On manifest variables, the best you can get is 86%, which is impressive. But when you include the drift diffusion model, you can get up to 93%. So these latent parameter estimations can boost what you get from the manifest models. Using my data on the DBS group, they're demonstrating that when you predict DBS patients, Parkinson's patients with deep brain stimulation on or off from the exact data I showed you earlier, discriminating them based on raw response time only gives you 64%. But drift diffusion model gets you, I think, an impressive increase to 86% discrimination. And again, because the deficit we're observing in performance isn't along a single dimension. It's both a response time and accuracy difference. So pulling up the latent parameter that underlies that probably gives you better explanatory power. And the same data I showed you earlier, looking at brain behavior relationships, not just looking at um, the difference in threshold, but the influence of frontal theta, <coughs> low conflict and high conflict, can help discriminate these groups as well. So integrating the brain modeling approach to these diagnostic categories can help with this general aim in computational psychiatry of discriminating groups Based on, di uh, based on observable objective indicators. So as the final summary, I've demonstrated to you one tiny facet of one tiny field of a part of decision making. But it's one tiny facet that we've explained in extreme depth. We know to an uh, impressive degree the way by which decision threshold in two alternative force choice tasks is advanced through an alarm bell in, uh, in mid-frontal cortex is evidence from all these different types of methodologies that have supported, to the slamming on the bricks as evidence from deep brain simulation um, and recording spikes and bolt signals in the cell that we please have yielded. What might be even nexter would be to include this knowledge in some form of package. And this would be perhaps uh, reinforcement learning responses to losses, for example. I gave a talk about two weeks ago in neuroscience. I didn't want to have any overlap here, but that was on using another type of class of models to discriminate learning abilities, learning rates, sensitivity to rewards and punishments. Uh, perhaps resting state scans, using all of these objective indicators based on all the sort of groundwork we lay and combining these together using pattern classification and machine learning to successfully parse group time. I think that's the even nexter arm of this integrated 
uh, modeling empirical or computational psychiatry approach. So before I finish, I'd be happy to take questions. I'd like to thank my colleagues, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which uh, funded the DBS work. Thank you very much. Almost none. I have tons of REST data of EEG, just huge amounts, and I never know what to do. There's almost a problem of analysis paralysis because I have too many free dimensions. I have a few ideas that uh, I'd like to try, and I keep gathering the REST data because I imagine a day where uh, I have nothing on my plate and I can start on it. I, I think it'll be useful, um, but people haven't made a lot of the EEG at REST. You've seen that there's a few things, fertile asymmetry, there's microstates but people haven't exploited it, I think, to its full potential. I think we'll see that at some point in the next 10 years or so. Some brilliant undergrad is working right now on new ideas, and it's just so data rich. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>